Hello and welcome to the Writers and Illustrators of the Future podcast. This podcast has all types of guests. We've got past winners, we've got judges, industry professionals, and it's all geared towards helping the aspiring writer and artist achieve their goal of becoming a published writer or artist. It was created in 1983, originally as a contest by Owen Hubbard, and has now grown to entrants from over 175 countries. Today we have a very special guest. He was a winner in volume 31. His name is Martin Shoemaker. Welcome, Martin. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. So um, you've become very, very involved with the contest since winning. Just um, It was funny when I looked to see when you were published. I thought you were published decades ago, and I found out, wow, it was only in volume 31, five years ago. But you've become so involved with the contest, supporting it, uh, helping on the forum, that uh, I was a bit surprised when I went, wow. You're a relatively new winner, but you're like, you've got all kinds of things happening for yourself. So tell me about your career since uh, winning the contest back there in, in Volume 31. Oh, it, it's, it's been quite, quite an adventure since then. Uh, the contest itself got me uh, opportunities to speak at uh, Worldcon that year. We had uh, several of our winners from that year. Six of us, I think, were all at Worldcon that year to... Um, sign books and talk to people. Um, I had already been having small amounts of publications prior to that, not enough that I had pulled out. But since then, I have uh, qualified for SIFA. I have had uh, several stories now appear in different uh, Year's Best anthologies, particularly my story today and Paul has been in now four different Year's Best and eight different international translations. Um, and it has been, become the basis of my first novel, Today I'm Carrie. And that was the Today I'm Paul? Yeah. Yeah. And um, you also had your, uh, your, your book, Blue Collar Space, too, in 2018. Yeah, that was a collection of stories that have appeared in analog prior to that, and I, I reprinted them in that collection. Um, I have basically my my common universe for many of my stories is blue collar space universe it is near space near future hard science fiction um i like to think of it as stories following on in the tradition of the apollo program i get it all right so um now with the uh earlier this year release of today i'm carrie do you have more coming in that um in that universe of today i am it's a discussion that's going on with my agent and my publisher right now. I have some ideas for what the next book could be. Uh, we haven't yet settled on if we're going to do more than that one, or I've got some other, other universes that I'm working on as well. I get it. All right. So um, anyway, so I'm very excited to hear whichever way it's going to go. So um, since winning the contest, you've gotten involved uh, quite a bit with the forum. Was that something, the Rise of the Future forum, was that something you were involved with before winning and then just continued or something that you adopted once you won? The, the forum, excuse me, is one of the contributing elements to my winning. Um, when I first entered, the very first time I knew basically nothing about the contest other than it had been recommended by Dean Wesley Smith and Chris and Catherine Rush and Jerry Purnell, who were all judges at the time. Of course, we've lost Jerry since. Right. Um, they they all talked about it as a good opportunity for new writers. So I submitted a story not really knowing what it was about at all. And three months later, I get a call from Joni telling me that that story was a finalist. And I suddenly said, oh, maybe I better pay more attention to this. And so I looked up the contest and looked for information online, and I stumbled upon Brad Torgerson's blog post about when he won the contest and how amazing the workshop was and how amazing the awards show was and everything. And he recommended people get involved with the forum because at that time he was the admin for the forum before he had to go off and do stuff for the army. Right. And so Brad led me to the forum and the forum led me to some of the absolute best advice and also some of the best friendships and support I could ever ask for in this business. Um, forum basically it, it 
ebbs and flows like any such place does. Sometimes we've got a lot of people participating. Sometimes it's got down smaller because once people win, they tend to find that, okay, the forum is so good, but now I need to work on the next level of my career. So they start looking for other places that they can get more information. Right. So we tend to have, as winners come along, they hang out on the forum when they can, but it's they're not as active as they are before they went. So it comes and goes. We generally have got a good bunch of people there who take the contest very seriously, who read all of Dave's tips, who talk to past winners, who cheer each other on, who do um, first readings for each other's work. It's an amazing opportunity to meet up with people who are at the same peer level, all working on the same goal, and incredibly supportive. If there's somebody on that forum who is competitive and backbiting, I haven't seen it. Right. What I have seen is people who are like, I want to win. And if I can't win, then I want you to win because you're one of my forum buddies. That's like an amazing, because I know we had um, um, another more recent winner on, um, and he was just talking about how the forum helped him a lot as well on winning the contest. So like for yourself, you'd art, you found out about after the fact of, of having been announced a finalist? And after my first finalist, I learned about the forum and became very involved. That was around, uh, I want to say, volume 27. Oh, so that was, that was four years before your win then. Right. And so I was an active participant in the forum. And when I finally won... I had this huge cheering session of all the forum members. They all were so proud to see how I had come along, and I was cheering them on. Uh, Carrie English, who was another popular person on the forum, another very persistent poster, was in the same year with me. Um, And we had past past year winners who were members of the forum by this huge support system through there. And... What I found, and I said this pretty much in my acceptance speech, what I found was that the contest is about paying it forward. Yeah. But the forum is about paying it now. That the forum members are helping each other at this moment to say, here's the next step. Here's how you can figure out what it takes to win this contest and go out there and meet all these judges and get these next set of opportunities. Anytime a forum member wins, it's like we all win. That's something that's, that's really cool about definitely Writers of the Future where, I mean, we're going to be heading off pretty soon to uh, Dragon Con and to uh, Salt Lake City Fan X. And we've got winners going back to Volume 7 that are going to be at our, at our table signing books and just very happy to be, you know, still part of the family. And that goes back, that's, you know, uh, almost 30 years. Yeah. And, and that too, not just the winners, but the judges, I didn't understand and appreciate this when I was a winner. It wasn't until I came back and saw it from the outside perspective as a past winner, how much the judges really care about the winners, about their their careers and about their opportunities and want to be out there helping really is sort of a family feel to it. Exactly. But it's also interesting, too, that so many of our judges are either – themselves past contest entrants who had proed out or who were winners of the contest you know so it's mm-hmm. you know so it's um it's, it's one of those it's a self um continuing legacy that just keeps going and obviously mr hubbard started it and continues to fund it but it's just amazing that the the caliber of of writers that are involved with this as the as the judges and as winners like yourself and Carrie, you mentioned Carrie English, who are there to just really lend that helping hand to the next rider as you yourself continue to move up the ladder. Mm-hmm. Because those those winners each year, to me, they're family. Yeah. And I get to know some of them better than others, but but they're family. They are people who I know where they're at because I've been there, and I'm hoping that I'm going to see them where I'm at before too long. Yeah. That's really, really good. So what is like winning the Rise of the Future contest actually done for you? You know, from yourself just from a very analytical perspective. The biggest thing from my perspective, I mean everybody gets different things out of it, 
But the biggest thing from my perspective has been the network of all these people who are trying to help me and who are cheering me on and encouraging me that I can go to these judges and I can ask them questions and get advice and have them understand who I am that they have to believe. I mean, first of all, the judges are some of the most incredibly helpful people on the planet anyway. Yeah. But especially when it comes to winners, these are people that they know have what it takes. And this is, this is a lesson that I think that winners have to, have to really internalize, especially today, because the contest gets more competitive every year. If you are winning the contest, you are writing at a professional level. You have what it takes. Yeah. And you might not even believe it yet, but the judges do. The judges, the contest, the past winners all understand you have what it takes. Now, nothing guarantees anybody a career. Anybody can find that oh, their writing has gone out of style or they don't have the ideas that are popular. Nothing guarantees anybody a career. But in terms of ability, if you've won this contest, the judges know you are someone who can do the work and you like to encourage that. Good. Good. That's a very good point. And like you said, everybody's got a different takeaway on it or a different, um, different aspect of, that, of, a, of, a com- of a common takeaway. But this is it's something that we really pride ourselves on is, is that family that you're talking about and just really helping people to actually make it forward. And um, so this is good. I, mean, I, I know friends who have... I know friends who have come away from the workshop and the contest with deals that they've made because they made the right connections um, or agents that they found, publishers they've gotten connected to. So there's so many things that come along that are beneficial. Um, I even this year uh, got to co-author a book with Kevin J. Anderson, one of our best judges. And Kevin said, hey, I know Martin understands dictation software, and I need to do a book on dictation, but I don't use software. So, Martin, could you write this part of the book? I have that opportunity because Kevin knows me, and Kevin knows me because of the content. Right. That's, that's a very, very good point there. So, why should somebody, you know, taking what you said there, what would be, like, reasons, or from your, again, from your perspective, why, why aspiring writers should enter the Writers of the Future contest? Oh, there are, there are many levels of reasons. First, it is a premium market. You're paying professional rates and prize money. And I don't know if everybody entering understands that they're getting both. That a winner gets a prize, but a winner also gets a professional payment for their story. A per word, but this is a professional rate. And publication in a very prestigious volume, especially now that you've gone to the color illustration Uh, People are blown away when they see the uh, color illustrations. The illustrators were always doing good work, but you wouldn't necessarily see that in full blooming color. Right. And so not everybody realized just how good the work is. Now, when they see that book, it's a pretty book. It is. And so this is a lot of visibility for you. And then on top of that, there's all the connections you've made. First, in terms of the contest itself, that you folks are some of the biggest boosters in my career that I could ever ask for. That I can always go down there and look and see where you're showing off my works in the library, and when you read my work and give me feedback on it, you're all out there for that. And then to have the visibility in terms of the judges and visibility in terms of readers. Readers are now out there seeing, hey, these are writers of the future. To them, that means these are names I have to look for. And so people come along and find your work continuing down the road. They find it because they recognize you from the volume. Right. Well, that's, that's excellent. So that's, a, yeah, some people don't, you know, some people do, but some people don't realize it's, you have everything to gain and nothing to lose by entering the contest. You know, the. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely zero cost, which is rarer and rarer these days in contests that so many of them have administrative costs or this cost or that cost. And sometimes you can start to figure out that, hey, they're making their money off of entry fees. No, yeah. not here. No. You, you, you're, you're just trying to give us a, a venue to show our work. That's exactly what it was. And that was, that was original intention when it was, uh, 
when the contest was created back there in 83. I'm just curious, are you still in touch at all with uh, Tung Chi Lee? Uh, occasionally. Um, I have watched her career uh, largely through social media these days, that she's getting um, some good visibility that she's now gotten connected up with the, and I will, I will butcher the name, uh, I think it's AS, FA Association of Science Fiction Artists, something like that. Yeah. Um, she made connections with them at the World Con we were all at. So that's a, a good opportunity for her. Um, one of the things that it, it was fun hanging out with her and the rest at World Con, but we were all writers and she was the one illustrator there. So we had all these ways to connect up with all sorts of fellow writers. And we had no idea how you hooked up with artists. But fortunately, she is a, a very determined woman who went out and found it herself. Yeah, and it's um, one thing that's good now that, just as, as an aside, with um, Echo Chernick as a new coordinating judge, she's very active on the uh, convention circuit, and she's, ver you know, as an educator and um, just as a graphic designer herself, she's, she's very much on the social line. So she works a lot with the winners on how to connect up and making those connections because it is it's so important what the writers have had for so many years for the illustrators to be able to adopt that. Yeah, Echo and Lazarus are amazing. I know Lazarus better because he tends to comment a lot on my social media posts. Yeah. Um, I think Echo's, Echo's not a social media type, but he is. Uh, but the, it's a the team. Advice that they give in terms of how to how to raise your game, both in terms of your illustration and in terms of your professionalism, is just amazing for these artists. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, one thing too that just um, I think right now also because of like you said we've changed the format of our book, so now it's a trade paperback, and we've got the uh, the color plates in front of the book, so people can really see the caliber of artists that are winning this contest. It's going to be now with the illustrators, as it has been for a while with the writers, that there's only 12 winners that can get published in the book. Sometimes there's a finalist that gets published, but pretty much it's 12 uh, winners. And we have so many entrants. So now we have the, the other categories now that come in where we, get, we issue certificates to the um, you know, semifinalists. And people are now using that in their resumes as you know, as a, there are semifinalists, a finalist, and that takes the work out of the slush pile as well now because there's, it, it's known that the quality of, of work that Rise the Future uh, receives is such that if someone's either a winner or a finalist, it's worth looking at. Yeah, and, and Dave is very, very blunt about that. If you follow Dave's tips and Dave's discussions of the contest, yeah. basically the rules you set up are he gets to pick eight. That's it. Yeah. If he gets more than eight, which are absolutely professional quality work, he only gets to pick eight. He only, and then the judges only pick three of those. So a finalist is somebody who Dave would have been very proud to publish in a book with his name on it. It's just that for those eight, three of them, the other judges like better. Yeah. And when it comes to semifinalist, semifinalist is Dave says, this is somebody who I'd have been very happy to publish their work, but I only got to pick eight, and so I had to come up with a way out of, let's say it's 11 that, that quarter. Out of 11, I had to find a way to pick these eight over these other three. But right. that means that a semifinalist is somebody that Dave would have happily published in a pro market. So semifinalists and finalists are absolutely publication quality stories exactly and so that's what people need to realize too that even if they're not in the book if they can put that onto their um resume that it's going to do them so much good as uh, a point of introduction for their stories yep. so um i'm just a totally disrelated subject when somebody finds you on Facebook, it's got this, the UML guy. Can you explain that a bit, please? <laughs> <laughs> That's my other life, my, my, my day job. Uh, I'm a programmer in my day job. Unified modeling language, UML, 
is basically blueprint language for software. And I am a uh, professional in UML. I have courses for this. I've taught courses for University of Michigan. I've taught courses for Microsoft. I've taught courses for probably 60 or 70 different companies on drawing blueprints for software. Curiously enough, I often use the same blueprint language for mapping out my stories. Wow. Because there, it's, it's not just about code. It's about things in a system that do things and interact with each other. And it's about the motivation of the users doing, using the software, what they're trying to accomplish. Well, a story is all about motivations. A story is about things that happen. It turns out that in a lot of ways, my two jobs overlap. That software helps me think about structures and systems and how they behave. And fiction lets me think about what people want and what they expect and how they respond to things. So there's really a lot of feedback back and forth between them. Wow, that's very interesting. Because I, I went and I just, I looked at, okay, so what's UML? It's obviously it's something. And then I read, I'm like, okay, good. This is another question I'm going to ask him so that he can give me a, a, a very much, okay, how does this relate and stuff? So I got, I knew that you're a, a brain brain on the subject of, of, of programming. You're not just writing code. You actually write code and how to make code type thing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, and so it's, it's basically ways of drawing pictures to capture what somebody wants to happen. Or, if I turn it to fiction, it's pictures of what happens in my story. Wow, okay. Well, that's very interesting. So, with this then, how does somebody get a hold of you? That's, you know, so I was trying to work, okay, how do I put this here? And then I saw that, okay, I got to get this question answered before I go into this. How, if somebody wants to reach you, how do they, how do they reach you? Shoemaker.space, my website. Okay. Also, you can find me on Facebook as Martin L. Shoemaker. Um, there's probably other Martin Shoemakers on there, so make sure you include the L. Um, I'm pretty pretty reachable through both of those, and also, of course, through the forum. Absolutely. Now, on your Facebook page, if they find the right one, it has the UML guy is under your name, right? Mm-hmm. Good. That's where that Yeah. Came. Basically, I had a consulting business where I was trying to just promote just the design side of software, and that's the UML guy. Oh, okay. But then I use the UML also in my day-to-day work. I get it. All right. So um, I guess the last thing is one of those wrap-up questions. Any other stuff that uh, you wanted to say or that you thought would be important to discuss on talking to aspiring writers and artists who are listening to this podcast? The biggest lesson... I wish I had learned sooner is not to give up. And obviously sometimes you're not going to give up and you still won't make it. But I gave up and gave up and gave up for years and years and years. And when I finally gave up giving up, which was specifically because of this contest, when I managed to have a finalist my first time entering this contest, that's when things started changing. When I said, wait a minute, maybe my biggest failure is not my talent. It's not my ability. It's not my ideas. It's that I just don't try hard enough. And so this is one of the reasons why I am very, very, very grateful to the contest and so happy to help you folks out because when I was basically drowning and getting ready to give up again, you threw me that life, life preserver. Right. You you selected that story as a finalist and said, "Hey, you can do this." Well, that's a very good story, and that's a very good, um, very good message to people to get because a lot of people do they throw in they throw in the towel way too early. They don't give themselves the, the fair shake and realize it. it might take. Well, we had one winner this year forty seven times he entered before he won. Another person had twenty five times. So it's some people just have to really just work it and work it and work it and they persist and some people like you know rob sawyer kevin anderson they proed out before they had a chance to win but they were they were definitely making a, a steady go of it as an aspiring writer same thing with uh, several of our other judges right now 
who are pros now that you know they worked their way up the line through Rise of the Future, and some of them proed out. Some of them actually were winners. You know, the Dave Wolverton was, Eric Flint was, Sean Williams. So um, we have you know probably half a dozen more like that who were. They did like you did. You know, they they just didn't give up. They kept on going. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. Well, thank you very much, Martin. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. And thank you all for thank you, John. A, you're welcome. So, and thank you everybody for listening to this podcast. It's a uh, something we've been doing now for. We started in in April of this year. It's something we want to be able to give that little extra helping hand to the aspiring writer and artist, so that you don't give up, so that you do make that extra go at it to to reach your dream as a writer or an artist. Okay, Martin, thank you very much. Thank you.